Hi everyone, this is Gary Wilson and welcome to tonight's live investor agent webinar and as usual we do have uh, students on who've taken either the FLIP program or the the rental program. Those are programs specifically designed to just focus on those strategies. And <clears throat> Typically they they're actually are geared towards investors but as many of you know many of you are investors. Um, so you'll take what we're learning here in the investor agent program and once you start uh, leveraging your license and generating some cash flow. Of course, many people want to dive right into doing their own investing, and that's why we have those programs. We go we go a few layers deeper into each strategy. And uh, other than that, I'm not gonna. I don't want to talk about that tonight. They're they're out there. They're available. If anybody has an interest, obviously let me know. Um, and the fact that you're in this program, you're automatically a candidate for those programs. Uh, you know, we like to see you get your first transaction under your belt first, earning a commission. Um, before we take on anything new, you know, so we don't want you to take, in other words, we don't want you to be overwhelmed. Just focus on one thing at a time. And I promise you when you do that, you'll master the thing you're focusing on first. And then you can take that and build on that and take on the next thing. So in any case, what we're going to do tonight is this. Uh, this is the investor agent leverage page in the back of the, the what we call the Reader's Digest book. And it gives you 13 things to do when you first get started. But we're going to focus. We're going to go over this, and I'm going to focus on uh, numbers one, two, and three. And also, we're going to go back to module one of the training manual because a lot of people I've, I'm noticing are they're bypassing the initial steps. And I've had this conversation in the month of December. I bet I had it seven times. I was I keep a little tally of the of the types of conversations I have and what the subject matters are. And a lot of people are moving ahead quickly, and of course, we're all entrepreneurs. A lot of us are, are high-D type personalities, but I can promise you this. If you build a solid foundation, if you focus on the fundamentals first, the latter steps will come much more easily and much more profitably. And what I mean by that is if you, if you, you know, the other part of tonight we're, we're going to go over is, I'll just show you here. Uh, this is a school report. Many of you have seen it a number of times. I know Scott Mosley just recently built his. Uh, we're going to look at that and go back through the steps involved to determine the best areas to invest in. Even if you're not investing, you still need to do this for your clients, okay, because you're going to show them this information and help them make these wise decisions. A lot of people are bypassing this and going right into the uh, the marketing material. And I love the fact that you're you're aggressive and ambitious but I can tell you from experience because I used to do this guys I was I was Mr. Ready Fire Aim I would I would get out there work my butt off and I would make some money but I, I could I knew intuitively that I was making some mistakes sometimes I wasn't even aware of until after the mistake was made of course and missing things and when I learned to focus on these fundamentals it it allowed me to operate more efficiently with fewer mistakes and missing fewer fewer opportunities. Okay, maybe a better service partner, better service partner, better service provider, and obviously a better investor. So uh, that's why we just just think Larry Bird, guys. Larry Bird, of course, one of the most famous basketball players ever, and in in his illustrious career, every single day that he played, actually, I think every day. <clears throat> He practiced the fundamentals. So he was interviewed after his last game, and the interviewee, interviewer said, hey, Larry, and I'm just curious. You know, you had a great game today, but you don't seem like overly excited. You're retired now. You know, what did you do today? How did you prepare for the game? Did you? I, I assume the interviewer was thinking he sat back and read the newspaper and drank coffee. Larry Burr said, you know, I did the same thing I've been doing since I was a, a little boy who first started playing basketball. I got out my basketball, and I dribbled 3,000 times. And I passed 2,000 times, and I shot 1,000 times free throws. That's what he did. He focused on the fundamentals. I don't remember the exact numbers. It was something, some crazy number like that. I mean, you know, and this is a guy who's at the top of his profession. And anybody will tell you, okay, and for those of you who, are, who have practiced martial arts, you know in karate, the black belt practices the same kata as the white belt. The only difference is the black belt's done it one million times, okay? So enough said. That's my moment of preaching. Okay, let's go back to where uh, I was going to start, which was the first part of this evening's presentation. And by all means, if you have questions, uh, please, please uh, type them in the question box. 
and we will get to them, all right? So even for the veterans, I mean, we do this because just like I said, the veterans need this too. So here's how I want to start. Uh, I just had this conversation at 11 o'clock this morning, so about um, eight hours ago. And this was a veteran agent in Detroit. Uh, I'm not going to mention his name. He's a, he's a good guy. He's doing a great job investing. He's got a great, great little program going, a team going. He's doing awesome, and he's in the program now. So he's actually in the middle of building, or I'm sorry, um, he's loaded his uh, his contact management system, and I guess I could plug it if uh, if you guys wanted SmartForce is what it is, or Salesforce, excuse me, Salesforce. And now he's going through and cleaning it up, making sure he has accurate, correct information for everybody and complete information. You know, a contact is not a contact. If you don't, if you can't get a hold of them in three different ways, which is your phone number, their email address, and their physical address, okay? A good contact has all three. If you only have one of the above, uh, your, your your probability of, of uh, profiting with that client relationship is going to be dramatically diminished, okay? It's not that it's because you have more ways to get a hold of them. It's just they trust you enough and they value the relationship enough to give you all three forms of contact, okay? Okay. Um, so in any case, fundamentals, make sure everybody in your, number one, make sure you have a database, okay? So many of you are using like an Excel spreadsheet or your own, I've, I've seen people still use a um, hard copy book, like a binder, and that, that's fine if that's what works for you. The best system is the one you will use, okay? However, you want to make sure you have a system to begin with. So whether it's a binder or I, what I highly recommend is, Use something like um, Salesforce or Top Producer or um, even the one that comes, if you're a Keller Williams agent, that is, the one that's called eEdge, okay? Uh, you have that. Yeah, that's free, by the way, uh, where you pay for it as part of your, your monthly dues. So in your system, whatever system you have, you want to go through there and make sure you have as complete information as possible on everybody in your database. And while you're doing that, I want you to do one more thing. I want you to ask yourself, you know, you know, how do you know that person? And by the way, guys, I would write this down. How do you know that person? Okay, number one. The second question is, what do you know about them? Okay, now there's, there's two or three other questions. The next one is this. Generally speaking, you know, was it a good relationship or, or would you consider it a good, healthy relationship or is it one that's uh, tarnished or damaged? In other words, you want to ask yourself, do you think it is a profitable use of your time to be dealing with those people, even keeping them on your database? It's taken some time to do this. If the answer is, is uh, more no than yes, then remove them from your database. I know it seems harsh, but let's face it. You want to spend as much time as humanly possible on your best prospects, okay? If you rank your prospects on a scale of one from 10, one being least likely to engage in a transaction and 10 being most likely, you should spend most of your time with your 10s. Then the next amount of time you want to spend with your 9s, and after that your 8s, and on down the line. So if you're, if you're really doing a good business, you may never get below the number six, guys. You might never get to the five or belows, okay? Um, it, it, Regardless, though, at a minimum, nobody in your database should be a one. If you have ones in your database, you need to eliminate them, okay? And by the way, this process is something that you go through on a regular basis. I know people that do this um, monthly. I know people that do it semi-annually. At a minimum, you want to do this on an annual basis, okay? And the philosophy is this. We get up, We got up from Verizon. Years ago, we studied different businesses, and we studied Verizon, and what Verizon did was this. Every year when they did reviews, employer reviews, they would, on purpose, uh, lay off the bottom 5%, okay? And they were constantly trying to get people to move into the top 5%. And I know that that seems harsh, too, but the reality is, is this. They were focusing their time, energy, and money on the best employees, okay? So the people who came in at 5% or below were not going to get another chance, all right? Because the company decided to spend their time on the people who had the best, most likely probability of succeeding. You want to do the same thing, guys, with your contact management system, okay? This is what the pros do. And my, my goal for each and every one of you is to have you move up the ranks 
and into that pro status like our like our investor agent is doing up in Detroit okay so that's the first part the second part is this when you know when you have the answer to how you know them and what you know about them and you've in general terms you've ranked them 1 to 10 are they are they one least likely to produce a commission check for you in the future or 10 most likely okay the next thing you want to do is this when you reflect on them ask yourself do you think they would be likely to invest? Okay, likely candidates to invest. Ten being most likely, one being least likely. All right. There's a number of reasons why we do this. This whole program is focused on the investor agent relationship. So you obviously want to focus your time, just like the the the, the veterans do, and just like uh, Verizon does, on the top one percent first. Okay, or the top ten percent. Excuse me, and then the, then the middle, and then the next ten percent. So the people who come out as tens, in your opinion, again, this is a an, in, an intuitive process based somewhat on facts and information in your memory and your recollection, but more importantly, a gut feeling. Okay, and it's going to number one to condition you to to trust your instincts, to trust your intuition, to trust your gut. Okay, and number two is it's going to get you in the practice of maintaining a healthy, profitable contact management system. All right. And the third thing is when you're focusing on the investor agent relationship, <clears throat> the people who are tens are the ones who you're going to invite to your first workshops. You're okay if you put on a classroom format, and some of you are already doing that now. Congratulations, by the way, for those of you who are. You've uh, graduated to that level. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are not familiar with that, once you've done your first workshop, it may be the first one, the second one, or the third one, a lot of our agents are graduating to what we call the classroom platform, the classroom uh, method of getting clients. And, and there's a four a four series uh, recorded webinar sessions, uh, four, uh, four of them, excuse me, that we did back in late September, early October, I believe, that, that cover that whole subject. It, it, it's a... Uh, we did it over a period of four weeks. Um, if you go to your your uh, member section on your on your uh, website for this program, you can go get the previously recorded webinars, the ones where they were, of course, they were live and we recorded them. And look look by the subject, look you know, the catalog by subject. Uh, look for the classroom scenario, and you'll see, see there's four of them out there. And you can download them and listen to them, or get the link and listen to the recording. Okay. And get familiar with it. If you're ready for that, let me know, and we'll walk you through the process. But in any case, back to tonight's subject. Okay, that last step is critical. Who's least likely to invest and who's most likely to invest? And when you do that, you may have to add a field. You may have to add a uh, take the first character of your comment section, depending on what system you use. The bottom line is you want to do that for everybody in your database. Okay, now here's the next part. That I want to go over with you. And here's where here's where the um, the people who I've seen succeed the most with their databases do this. And I've done it myself for years. I've been doing this for probably I bet daily for the last 13 years. And here's what I want you to do. Every day you're out. Okay. Some days you're out more than others. I get it. Okay. But every day you're out. You want to make a note of every person you meet whether you've already known them or you're meeting them for the very first time, you want to make sure you get their name and recall their name, okay? And if possible, get more information. Right now, you're just trying to get their name and some contact information. You ultimately want phone number, email, and physical address. Right now, just get something. And what you do at the end of the day is you take an extra five minutes, okay, bring up your contact management system, and add those people to your database because some of the people you meet, even though you've already known them, they may not have been in your contact manager system. Okay? You just simply weren't thinking of them before. And now you've run into them at the grocery store or school or the library, and you can put them in your contact manager system. And the brand new people, obviously, they're brand new uh, contacts, all right? So sometimes you get a business card, uh, but if you're meeting them enough to get their name, and you strike up a little bit of a conversation. And remember, the second question out of everybody's mouth is, what do you do? So when you ask them what do they do, you'll get their vocation, and you can follow up and say, really? You know, I might have an interest in contacting you later. Would you mind if I get your phone number 
or what's your email address? Just get something, okay? Try to get both if you can. And then when they ask you what you do, obviously you want to set yourself apart from the crowd. You don't want to just say, oh, I'm, I'm a real estate agent or I'm just an agent or something like that. Okay, that's what they're getting from everybody else. And there's there's uh, just in NAR alone, the National Association of Realtors, I think there's now 1,250,000, 1, something like that. Okay, what you want to say is, Oh, I, I've had my realtor's license and I specialize on investors. I focus on the investor business. I promise you will get a more favorable response from that than you will from just saying, oh, I'm, an, I'm a, just a realtor. OK, um, and you can let them know that you serve the general community, too, if that's what you choose to do. The bottom line is you're going to get their information every day. You know, I keep it. You all met me. Everybody in this program has met me a class. You see that I carry a Franklin Daily Planner. That's how I'm accomplished that, guys. As soon as I get out to my car, I write down who I met, okay? And I've jot down their contact information. Then at night, when I sit down on my computer, it takes less than five minutes to enter them into the system, okay? Now, of course, I have Beverly do that for me now, but years ago, I did that myself, and now Beverly does it for me. That one thing alone right there, guys, is, is what will get you to, you know, th say 30 or 60 people to two to 300 people within a matter of weeks. It, it'll, it, it will, it's going to be amazing, okay, how many people you can add to your database with that one technique. All right, another technique. And by the way, I'm going to take a pause here just to let you guys catch up on that. I know I gave you a lot of information, so take some quick notes, and I'm going to give you a few seconds to do that. And drink some milk. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, the next thing is this, especially for you guys who are just starting out or if you don't even have a, a systematized contact management system, pay really close attention here. I learned this from a guy, his name's John Zinsner, and he, I don't even know if he's still in the business. He was, he was old when he taught me this. One of the easiest things you can do to build your contact management system from scratch is to get out the phone book, okay? and start going through it alphabetically, A through Z. Take one letter of the alphabet every day for the next 26 days. You can do it Monday through Friday and do that over a five-week period and throw in an extra Saturday. But the bottom line is use 26 letters. Each day you want to go through the, the vocations in letter A, for example. You know, apple farmer, accountant, um, acu acupuncturist, whatever the case is, airline pilot, okay? Uh, and you want to write, you want to, first of all, create your own chart, or if you're in your contact management system, if you can add categories, add categories. I've done that for years. Um, so I have everybody broken down by vocation. And then go through that and think through, who do I know who's an accountant? Who do I know who's an actual, actual excuse me, acupuncturist, okay? If that's how you pronounce it. I don't even know if that's right. But go through every vocation in that letter in the alphabet, and they're all in the phone book, and ask yourself, who do you know who serves in that profession, okay? And here's the real kicker. Many of the people you know are actually going to be in the phone book, so you get their name and their phone number and their physical address, okay? But that is an awesome, awesome way to start from scratch with your contact management system. I can't emphasize that enough, guys. Extremely powerful and extremely prolific and extremely necessary. It's a, if you just try to do it from memory, you're going to struggle, and you'll never really build up your database. You've, you've got to use a tool like that to do it. And it it's, it's an awesome tool to use. So you can just, if you don't have a phone book, go online and Google Yellow Pages for your area, and you'll get the Yellow Pages for free for your area, okay? Uh, so in any case, now in the beginning, what we did is we actually created an Excel spreadsheet, and we, we created it with a category of vocation. Um, we had, we had literally dozens and dozens and dozens of vocations, and we, then we filled in the names. This was before we had Top Producer, okay? Now, just to give you an idea how powerful this is, guys, when I first started my contact management system, I was sitting in class, and John said, okay, write down everybody you know. And I think I had like 20 people because <laughs> I worked in banking and mergers and acquisitions, and I just, they just had to let it, I did, I did systems work okay I was behind the scenes so I didn't get out in the public and meet people so I had like 20 people okay it was embarrassing and John walked by and told me that trick and I'm telling you within three weeks I had almost 300 people 
in my database because I use that one technique. Now, obviously I'm more systematized and automated now. So fast forward here, 13 years, my database has between 60 and 70,000 people in it, okay? And that sounds kind of freaky, but I'm telling you, it happens, all right? Um, and by the way, it's not just all, all students. In fact, I only have about 400 students right now. So you're making up about 400 people out of that group, okay? Um, obviously, a lot of realtors in there. But in any case, uh, when I use that technique, my database went quickly to 1,000 and then very, went very quickly to 10,000. And I was told when I had 10,000 people, I should be making a lot of money. And guess what? I was making a lot of money. And I owe that to John Zizzer for showing me that technique, all right? Now, obviously, I need to figure out how to market to these people, and that's what this program is primarily about is how, to, how do you market to these folks. But I want to just spend time on this because it's that important. It's absolutely – it's not just foundational, guys. It's the keystone of your foundation. A keystone is the most important block in a foundation, all right? That's how important it is. Okay, let me check and see if we got any questions so far. Um, I hope you guys are taking notes, including the veterans in the group. Um, I will tell you this. I'm willing to bet you – I'll tell you what I want to do. This is how important this is. You know, we're constantly rolling out uh, – new platforms. We've obviously got one on flipping, one on buying rentals. We're working on one now on property management. We've been delayed a few weeks, although we have a podcast coming out in January from a guy, a friend of mine, who actually bought my property management business. We've become good friends. And uh, because a lot of students are asking about property management, so we're going to develop that training program. I'm, I'm going to, and you guys can mark my words on this. If you guys do what I just suggested for the next year, and you don't get at least a transaction out of it, I will give you one of the other training programs for free. Okay? So write that down. That's how important, that's how certain I am of, of this process and how critical it is. Okay? Let's see, uh, let's see uh, what we got here. Um, this is Lou. Okay, when looking through a phone book starting with A's, if I don't know an acupuncturist, do I just put down one of the names? Um, no, I wouldn't do that, Lou, because technically they're not a contact unless you've actually met them or been introduced to them or if it's somehow or another interacted with them to get their name and number and or email address, okay? And now, you can certainly stop by to see them. If you're out and about and you happen to stop by an office and you see that the, the office there, stop and introduce yourself. Say, hey, I'm Lou. You know, I work with investors. In fact, Lou, you might want to keep a keep a, a current stack of your booklet with you so you can drop it off and say, hey, you know, I thought you might be interested in this. This is a, some investment opportunities in the area, and more importantly, there are some tools in there you can use to figure out how to uh, analyze those properties, okay? Um, and now you've got a contact, all right? That, now that qualifies as a contact, but a uh, good question. Okay, all right, I think I, I, think I beat that horse pretty good. Um, does anybody feel like they're uh, – let me put it this way. Who here does who here does not see the value in what I just discussed when it comes to contact manager system? Because I'm hoping if I say who sees the value, every hand would be up or everybody would make a comment. Um, and every couple of months we'll do that again, guys, because we're always bringing in new people. And it's a great reminder to develop that habit. It's easy. Believe me, guys, I know it's easy to fall out of these good habits. But I can tell you that one thing alone, all the other things I've done, would not have happened as profitably if I hadn't done that first thing, all right? So in any case, we got through the first two steps here, all right? Now, the next thing is, is you want to reach out to these people, okay? And I'll give you a couple of quick, couple of big tips here. So we're just, guys, we're just focusing on just the very centrals here. Um, I'm not even going to talk about the, the, the workshop for another couple of minutes. The next thing you want to do is this. I want you to practice using some of the analysis tools that come with your training program. Now, some of you are brand new and you haven't even gotten module two yet. Don't worry, you'll get these, the calculators and the spreadsheets, spreadsheets between modules one and modules two, all right? What I want you to do is uh, by the end of module two, I want you to practice that process in there on yourself, you know, determining all the possibilities of investing in the area and going through that, that uh, iteration of narrowing the search down, okay, and continually cutting your search, the scope of your search in half. So if you have initially 100 properties that, you're, that you deem investment properties, okay, that are 
they're on your database as rentals or they're foreclosures, whatever they are, they're, they're candidates for flips or for rentals. You go through the analysis process and, and, and the first step is you cut that number in half just based on list price versus uh, market value. Okay, that's, I'm not going to talk about that tonight, but that's in module two. What I want you to do is practice using your tools on properties in your area. And you want to keep track of those properties, particularly ones you think, hey, according to this, looks like it might be a good deal. All right. And the reason is this. I'm going to have you send them to the people in your database that you just identified as being most likely to invest. Only use the tens first. And don't even do the nines, eights, and sevens, and sixes. Just do the tens first. Because all you're trying to do is test the waters and exercise your risk threshold and practice your dialogue, okay? And here's what you do, all right? You find a couple of properties, and let's say you're, you're working with, uh, you're gonna send an email to John Doe. John Doe is a uh, orthodontist, and something he said in the past, or you happen to be in his office with your child getting braces, and you saw, you know, um, Kiplinger's Magazine, on his, on his table outside or, or a book by Robert Kiyosaki or something about investing, or he maybe mentioned something in passing, like you heard him walking in the hallway talking to his receptionist saying, gee, I wish I could get that tenant out of there. They didn't pay their rent this month. Well, you now know that guy is an investor. He owns a piece of rental property. What you do is you email them, okay, email them the listing for the property, or if it's an off-market property, email them any information that you have on the property, and also give them – a sample of one of the calculators filled out, okay? At the same time, give him a blank copy of the whatever calculator you're using, one that's not filled out, because you're going to say, hey, hey, John, I have you know came across this property. I thought about you because of something I heard you say in, in passing or I saw a magazine in your office that led me to believe you were interested in investing in real estate. It's in your area. Uh, take a look at it. By the way, I included a calculator already filled out for you. And just just for, for fun, I included a blank one for you to try on your own. I want you to see some of the tools I have that are available to help you analyze investment properties. Okay. Now, I'll slow down and let you write that stuff down, guys, because that's you can use that, that uh, scripting almost verbatim. All right. Okay. Now, what you want to do is at the end of the email say, you know, how about if I follow up with you in the next day or so? Okay, you're not making any firm commitments. You're not telling them you're going to stop by and visit them in person. You're not even saying you're going to make them give them a phone call. You're just saying you're going to follow up with them, which leaves the door open for you to send another email, to send a text message if you have their phone number, cell phone, or call them if you have their cell or call them at the office. Okay, now. This is where you have to be careful because if they're uh, self-employed service providers, they're going to be pretty busy, all right, and you want to be mindful of that. So what you might want to do is follow up with a text message that you have. It. That's what I would suggest first, all right? The bottom line is you want to pique their interest, intrigue them by giving them something like the Opportunity Evaluator, all right, or the link for the Rental Property Reporter, or the rehab worksheet for flips, whatever the case is, whatever one's appropriate, you intrigue them by giving them not just one that's filled out where you've done the work for them, because remember, we don't we don't want to do that. We want them to do the work. So you give them a blank one, and I can promise you no other agent is doing that, all right? So you pique their interest, you've intrigued them, and, you know, it, one, one out of, or three times out of 25, you're going to get some takers, just by doing that. It's the same thing with the, the booklet that we use. It's, you're doing the same thing we do in a booklet. You're just doing more of a one-on-one -on -one approach, okay? You're basically building up your risk threshold. Um, so, Scott, so, Scott, if you're still on the phone here, um, here's a quick tidbit for you. So, you've just done your first booklet mailing. Now, what you could do is if you're in an area where one of those offices uh, resides, Scott, stop in and visit them. Remember, business casual, okay? And say, hey, I'm Scott. I'm the guy that sent you that. You know, what do you think? Do you think you have an interest in this? Okay. And at first you'll get kind of a, a non-committal response because you're a little bit, you're kind of caught them off guard a little bit. They're not, they're not ready for you. They haven't, they don't know you're coming to visit them. So then what you say, Scott, and for everyone else is, hey, no worries. You know, how about if I just set you up on a search to show you what else is possible in your area? 
I promise you're going to get a lot more favorable responses for that. Okay, so a little bit of a sidebar there for Scott. Anybody else who's who's sending out their booklet or has just recently sent them out. All right. Um, so back to this. You you're doing this now again on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You're going through your contact management system, looking for the people you said were a 10, 10 being most likely to invest. Okay. And you just send them one, two, maybe three properties. You don't want to send them any more than that, guys. Um, if you know, in fact, that they're a regular investor, by all means, send them five or six, okay? But remember, people that you don't know if they'd invested before, they may not have, and you don't want to overwhelm them. Just send them one to three properties, and that's it, all right? And the tools, okay? And then you do, guess what? You have to follow up. <laughs> so now you've got to determine the best way to follow up with these people, and it's it's a case-by-case -case basis. If you know them enough to know that they're going to be, they like communicating with text messaging better, then use that. If you think they like communicating with emails better, then do that. If you think they're more direct and they would rather communicate verbally, then give them a phone call by all means. Um, now, the, the catch here is if they're, again, self-employed service providers, don't call them on their cell because it could be in the middle of appointment. Call them on the office line, and they'll tell you if, the, if they're in with a patient or not, okay? Um, so in any case, uh, that's the very first thing you do once you've got your contact management system up and running. You, you want to exercise it. You want to grab the low-hanging fruit. And even if you just do – in fact, I would do this. I would take one night take one or two hours to find a couple likely investor, excuse me, investments, all right? Build a little email with that, with the links, okay, and, and, and the attachments, and go ahead and, and and send that, put that verbiage in there that I gave you, and send it to every one of your tens. Do it all in the same night. And while you've got the momentum going, send it to all of your tens. It could be five of them, it could be 25 of them, I don't know. Everybody's different. But send them to all your tens, okay? And then give yourself the next 48 hours. You want to, and by the way, this is critical. The follow-up has to occur in preferably within a day and no later than two days, okay? If you follow up three days or beyond, your, your chances of success drop dramatically, all right? So you want to follow up within 48 hours, preferably within a day, all right? Um, and again, email, text, phone call, whatever you think is best. And don't be afraid to try, guys. Don't, don't not do it because you're afraid, well, they, they, what if they don't like texting? Well, you don't know that. You've got to try to find out. And don't worry if you mess up on one. There's going to be plenty more. I promise you that. Okay? So the follow-up is critical. So that's the next thing you want to do. So let's do a real quick, re, real quick recap here. First thing is, is you're going to replay this recording and review your notes so you know how to go through your contact management system to get it to be a professional contact management system, one that's actually going to generate profits from you. Okay? The next thing is, is the people that you've identified as being most likely to invest, your tens, you're going to go out and do some research in your database, find properties, uh, just a small handful, send them to these folks with copies of the evaluation sheets or the calculators, depending on whatever, whether you're doing a flip or a rental, okay, one filled out and one blank, okay. Let's do a quick pause here and check for questions. Uh, let's see. Um, Okay, this is uh, Donna. Hi, Donna. Uh, what if you don't have any properties to send your investors? How do you find properties? Okay, so, and by, by the way, I hope that's Donna because the, the name again is getting cut off here. Um, looks like Donna Bedford. So, in any case, um, Donna, to answer your question, you want to look in your database and your content, excuse me, you want to look in your MLS system right away. Um, I would get used to doing this practice. If you're in Module 2, I give you the actual sequence of steps to follow in Module 2 and how do you actually go through uh, all the possibilities and narrow that search down. Yeah, I do it once for flips and once for rentals. So you want to do that if you're in Module 2. If you haven't gotten Module 2 yet, you should be getting it any day if you've already got Module 1. The fact that you're on the webinar tells me you've already at least gotten Module 1. Um, but go on, on every MLS system – they're broken down by category, okay, or property type. So all of your single-family homes will be in one section or one database. All of your um, farms and land will be on another. Uh, industrial space will be on another. 
uh, retail will be on one, office space on another one, and then the, and then the investor ones. Or what we you know, I would maybe just start with multi units. Okay, go to look for the ones that are identified as rental properties. Get all of them out there, and then go through using the process in Module Two to narrow that search down and fo and get it down from maybe you know 50 properties wherever you are in the country down to about five or six. Okay, okay, and then if you can get it down from there further to three, that's that's what you want to try to do. Um, but follow that process, Donna. You should come up with a handful of properties. That's to look at rentals. If you're looking for flips, then what you want to do is you want to search for properties that are uh, foreclosures or short sales. You want to look for people who have uh, there's in the ownership line or in the remarks says something about POA or power of attorney. Okay, that could be probate. In other words, someone passed away. Uh, you certainly could, should be looking for REOs, you know, bank owned properties, foreclosures. We said that. Um, also, possibly you could find some, some good uh, FISBOs off the system and also some expires on the system. The, all those, the last, the group I just mentioned there, Donna, all would make good candidates, potentially good candidates for flips, okay? Um, the rentals are easy because they're all identified as rental properties, right? It's all the other ones that you need to figure out what makes sense for a flip that you've got to go through a little bit more work and understand your, your MLS system and what keywords and phrases people are using, like bank, bank owned, REO, uh, foreclosure, VA, Fannie Mae, which is FNMA. Um, you know, all of those keywords or identifiers you can key in on in your search criteria. Okay, that's how you find them. Now, I prefer also doing rentals on this technique, by the way, because I like looking for rentals that are already up and running and showing an income because I can get a lot more financial data on those properties. In order to determine if a flip property is a good flip, you've actually got to physically go out there and do the do the walkthrough, do the physical analysis on the property to determine that the project is a small enough scope that it leaves profit for you in the case of a flip. Okay, that's why this technique works better for rentals. It's just less time consuming. All right. So, in any case, good question. Uh, also, if you're in one of the areas. Um, it's, it has really tight inventory, which is a lot of places around North America, U.S. and Canada right now. Um, you can use your county courthouse records to identify people who are in probate, people going through divorce, people going through a foreclosure, through bankruptcy, okay, and use our letter technique to reach out to those people and get some potential properties that might work for flips. That's another good way to get potential inventory that's not on the MLS system. You can also use the same letter that we give you in the program, the one I go over in the class in the market center, you can also use that to write the, those people, but also write people who own rental properties because a lot of people who own rental properties will be more than happy to sell them because they're struggling. They don't know what to do. They're getting beat up on their rent. All kinds of stuff's happening. Reach out to those people and get some inventory that's off the, that's off the system, okay? Uh, let's see. This is uh, Scott. Hi, hi, Gary. Can you recommend a lead-in? In regards to the email to your top 10, particularly if it has been a while since you spoke with them. Okay, Scott, yeah, Here, here's uh, some good language you can use. You know, dear Scott, uh, I came across this property the other day or today while I'm looking for investment properties, and I thought of you because of something, you know, there must be something, Scott, some reason why you think there were 10. Because I saw a book on your, on your counter at your office that was about investing, or was Rich Dad Poor Dad, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, or was, um, you know, from Carlton Sheets or Russ Whitney or Ron, Ron Legrand, one of the old, uh, you know, investor gurus. Something, whatever it was, Scott, that, that made you believe that there are 10, put it in there. Because of this, I thought of you. So whatever the this is, is what you put in there. So, dear, dear Scott, um, I came across this property during doing some research for an investment property, and I thought of you because of, and you fill in the blank, okay? Um, by the way, I included a, a worksheet, an analysis worksheet for you to show you uh, why this may make a good investment. And by the way, I, I also giving you a blank one you can use for this to run your own numbers and give them the actual live link, give them the actual Excel spreadsheet uh, so that's interactive.
by the way, Scott. And so that, so that, by the way, so that you can practice on this yourself. And more importantly, you have, if you have other properties you thought you might be interested in, use this calculator. It's the one, it's the one true test of a good rental property. Okay. Um, by the way, um, I will reach out to you in the next day or so to discuss this. Thank you very much, Scott. And then put in your, your contact information. Okay. Um, so if, if you believe there are 10, that's a pretty good sign. If you haven't spoken to him for a while, um, you know, you need to be, uh, you can, you can build a little, build a little rapport in the beginning. And you're going to do that by saying, Hey, I, I came across this property and thought of you, but definitely be direct. Um, you know, as far as you following up with them, because you haven't heard from him for a while, you don't want to leave it open ended. Don't leave, never do this. Never say, call me when you have a chance or, uh, when you're ready let, to discuss this, let me know. Because when you give up control, you give up profit. So that's why I always want to say, um, I'll reach out to you in the, in the next day or so. Okay. Now they're expecting your call. Even if they're somewhat uh, hesitant, at least they got the expectation you're going to reach out to them. Okay. So that should work for you. Uh, let's see. We've got some other questions here. Um, uh, Scott says, "Oh, I have to run." Oh, thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, get get the recording tomorrow, Scott. We're gonna we're gonna stop at eight tonight because um, I know a lot of people said they're they're with family or family's still in town visiting, and I that's why I didn't want to do it last week, but I didn't want to skip two weeks in a row. That's why we're having one this week, and I do appreciate we got a lot of people on tonight, um, so I appreciate you guys your, your your ambition and your your genuine interest in progressing here. So thanks, Scott. Have a good night, buddy. And uh, maybe give me a call Saturday or Sunday if you want. Okay, so back to this, guys. We're getting short on time here, and I want to get to the next subject. Um, that's really all I wanted you to do uh, right now. Um, you know, you're basically looking to nurture these relationships. That's what number four is all about, all right? Um, and you can do that on a regular basis without spending a dime. Without So there was uh, there was a person I had on a one-on-one -on -one a few weeks ago, and uh, she's on. Hi, I'm not going to mention your name, <laughs> but uh, I was out in Santa Barbara, and we had a great conversation about how to actually get things started, and I was going over this with her. So so pay attention here, because um, I know we're scheduled. Actually, i just say it's Angie. Angie, we know we're scheduled to meet again, I think, on the 9th, I think it is, of January. So here's what you want to do. Uh, focus on nurturing these relationships, because it's a low-hanging fruit. 10% of your database we know statistically is going to turn into an investor transaction. Um, you could also, as a matter of fact, I think you should join your local investors group. Okay. Could be RIA, could be Acre. I know it's a little bit of dues. Um, you're not looking to join them to get, to get clients. You can, if you want to, but quite frankly, they'll drive you crazy. What you're looking to do is to, to learn the names of good contractors, investors, plumbers, you know, of course, uh, excuse me, electricians, plumbers, carpenters, you name it, carpeting people, insurance people, of course, lenders. You want lenders who can actually get investment deals funded, right? Okay. So, and the next thing is, is uh, figure out how to go access your county uh, tax assessment database. Everyone in the country is loaded right now out of, I think out of the 3,000 we've, we've looked at, only four were not loaded but they had a county population of like 17 or something. So that only makes sense. But you want to get access. You want to figure out how to look at your county tax assessment databases. Uh, we'll be getting to that stuff uh, in future future modules, okay? Um, in any case, uh, let's get over to the next thing here, all right? I'm going to go over this, uh, not in a lot of detail because you guys have all seen this, all right? But I want to refresh your memory, all right? Uh, Let's see. I want to, let me let me check questions real quick. Cause I'm sorry. Before we get into the next thing, I just want to make sure we're not leaving anybody uh, hanging here. Okay, so far so good. All right, you, everybody should reckon this, guys. This is the school report. And again, just to refresh your memory, here's why we use it in the case of investing or working with investors. We want to know by school district. School districts, Hopewell, Butler, Mars, Seneca, these are just different school districts from around the country. Okay. We want to know what's active, which is current, currently what's active. Okay. And we want to know what's sold in 90 days. All right. And we want to know that in price bands. Now, the price bands are relative. So if you're in 
Burlingame, California, which is just south of the Golden Gate Bridge, the average home price was $1.3 million. Well, obviously, you're not going to get much activity down here at the 1 to 150 range. So you might make these first several ranges $100,000 increments, okay, up to a million. And then you might be might do a quarter million after that, something like that, all right? But within each band, within each price band, you've got what's active and what's sold. Now, I can see this example here. 35 homes are currently active. In the last 90 days, only 26 are sold. That does not bode well for this neighborhood. That means there's more inventory than we have people buying. On the other hand, if you go all the way over here to the right and you look down, these are the examples I use in class, you'll see in these next three lines, probably two to three times as many homes have been selling that are currently active. Well, I don't know about you guys, but if I'm flipping a home, I want to flip a home here. I want to flip a home where people are selling and people are buying, okay? And I'm sure your investors feel the same way. And if you're a flipper like me, this is like the 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 – the key to the vault. This is where you flip homes. This is just one example, okay? Uh, there might be others down here too. Um, I don't know if I see any off the top of my head here. But uh, oh, here's one, 26 sold and 10 active. That's a pretty good one there. So in any case, you want to find out what these areas are, school district and price range, okay? You do that by using MLS searches and get the results and fill in these blanks, okay? So now you know by school district and within price range, what are the good areas to be flipping homes in? This is used for flipping, all right? Now, if you're a member, and by the way, here's the zipcodes.com. You can use that for more information. This is self-explanatory. I don't really need to cover this. It's easy. Everybody got the link. It's, it's literally zipcodes.com, okay? There it is right there, okay? But the next thing is absolutely critical, all right? And here's an example of a good flipping neighborhood. As you can see, there's no apartments, okay? And there's a lot of homes, a lot of homes in these carrier routes. And I can see their average home price. So what you do is you go back to your, start with your school report, okay? You've got the price range, 150 to 200,000, or excuse me, 150 to 300,000, okay? Now we go plug in all the zip codes for that area, okay? Oops, excuse me, okay, here we go. And there's, there's a zip code right here, you plug it in. Okay, look at the carrier routes, and you can see there's three carrier routes, one, two, three, within that price range. Now you can build an MLS search based on this carrier route. You expand this, click on this, it expands and shows you the carrier route, and draw a polygram and build a map search on only these three areas, okay? Now you've got a, you're, you're set up to show clients whatever it is they need uh, in the areas that you know properties are properties are being listed and properties are being sold, and by default, obviously that's where those guys, that's where your investors want to invest. So let me stop here for just a second. Let me bring the panel back over so I can check for questions. Uh, okay, so far I think we are caught up. Yeah. All right, so let me get you let me let you guys write some notes down if you need to write more notes. Hang on one second. Okay. So the, the third thing we do when we're determining the areas to invest in is usual local planning commission website, okay? And I always like to use the example of age. Now again, you can get everything you want on any neighborhood on these websites, okay? You can get everything related to sex, age, race, religion. You've got all right here. Look at this. Race, uh, age, broken down in multiple categories, okay? Uh, total population. Uh, you get down here. Household type, all right? Um, occupancy. How many are rentals? How many are, are owner-occupied? All of this information is available to you, all right? People with disabilities, the percentage and the numbers, all right? Um, Let's see, people, uh, again, disabilities again. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But the reason this is important is this, all right? You want to make sure your investors are investing in the areas that are most likely to have homes that are selling easily and for closest to list price, okay? If you ask any flipper, they're going to tell you, I want to sell my home fast, and I want, I want as much 
as close to list price as possible. So the example that we give in class is this. Look at the category of age. If you're flipping a, a medium price home to a middle class family that on average has 2.3 children, and we can tell that by looking at the, uh, the family makeup here, okay? You can just do simple math, average household size, just like less than two people, average, average family size, 2.78. So you have those numbers, okay? Now, does the average family want to move into a neighborhood where the largest segment of the population is getting ready to retire? That's, that's the age-old question, and the answer is no. They want to move into an area where there's more people aged 25 to 44 that have 2.3 children, or in this case, 2.8 children, 2.78 to be exact, okay? That's how and why you use this information. So when you do that, all of a sudden, now your investors are buying in the, this, the right neighborhoods with the right demographics and social graphics to enable them to sell their medium price home quickly to a middle class family with 2.78 children, okay? That's what that's all about. Yes, it takes practice, but once you do this one time, guys, you've mastered the technique, and more importantly, you can repeat this for any number of areas in your area of service. So let's say you're in um, Riverside, California, okay? Uh, great area to be in right now, great area to be investing in or work with investors. You've got a great population. Um, you could go to your planning commission website, get all this information, and determine – and you've got your if – you, if you focus on the school district first, there might be multiple school districts and multiple areas within those school districts that make sense to invest. You want to validate that by looking at this demographic and sociographic information because you might find out one-third or one-half of the areas that you determine look good on paper might look good on paper, but they're selling to other people who are downsizing to two-bedroom bungalows, for example, okay? Um, and it might not be the best area to try to flip a home because your prospective buyers drive by and see everybody uh, in the driveway looking like they're, they're over 55 and there's not a child to be found anywhere. The family with two or three children does not want to move into a neighborhood where there's no children. I can promise you that. Yes, you can sell a house. I'm not saying you can't. But might it take longer? Yes, it probably will. And might you not get full list price? That's right. You might not. You're looking to help your clients get closer to list price. All right, as, and as quickly as possible. So the reason I, I gave you this is I know it's a – we go over this a lot in our class and because it's, it's very important. And I had this conversation with um, – matter of fact, I think it was Brian from Chino Hills not, not too long ago about this very subject. And when you focus on these fundamentals, guys, it not only helps you be a better investor if that's what you're doing, but it really helps your clients be better investors. They're going to make more money, and you're going to make more money. So I hope that helps you guys a lot. Um, focus on this. It's all in the training manuals. Practice it. Here's the, here's the second thing I want to ask you guys to do here. You don't have to do this all in the next week, although I think you should. But practice this, okay? Practice, practice, practice what we just showed you tonight. Go to melissadata.com, okay? Pull up some zip codes. Look at the carrier routes. See if those average home prices are in the range for your area that you determine might make the best investment areas in this report right here, okay? So practice that. I would say right now for the people who are just beginning, I would rather see you focus on your contact management system if you're a veteran agent. And what I talked about the first part of tonight uh, kind of got you a little bit nervous <laughs> because you know you haven't been, re been working on your contact management system. That comes first. And this comes second. That's why I did it in that order tonight, okay? Okay, let me check for questions here. Um, let's see. Okay, this is – hi, Angie. Angie, okay, am, am I the only one with a choppy connection? Um, I haven't heard from any, anybody else, Angie. I'm going to check here the audio real quick. Uh, let's see. Boom working, mic working. looks like the audio is okay. Um it could be in the network, Angie. It could be even on your computer, perhaps. And more likely, it's in a network. Um, I know you're out in Southern California. In fact, I think you're in Marina del Rey. Uh, and let's see, it's five. The sun's going down out there. 
It could be res related to the sun going down. That affects sometimes uh, um, reception, believe it or not. So that's probably the case. For anybody who's out in Southern California, close to the, the coast, as the sun has out over the water, you're going to start to, uh, your, your connection, your the audio is going to start to sound a little scratchy. And sometimes you might get lines in your video too. So uh, in any case, uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, that was Angie from Orlando. Okay, I thought you were Angie from uh, Marina del Rey. So you're 8 o'clock, actually. Um, I tell you what, I'll check the recording uh, later tonight, once I got to download it and upload it, we'll see, make sure everything's okay. Um, I apologize about that. I'm not sure everything's looking like it's working on this end. So in any case, guys, that's pretty much it for tonight. Um, that's a one-two punch. And everybody, it, unless you've mastered what we just described tonight, please, please practice it. Practice makes perfect. Uh, you've got to actually exercise the, the, the legs on this horse to make it work. And... It, it doesn't take long to start leveraging this activity into meeting people and getting them to sign up as your clients. And that's what you need to go out and get commissions, okay? Okay, I think that's it, guys. Looks like we're all good on the questions. I hope you all have, a, have had a, an, an awesome Christmas, or if you celebrate a Hanukkah, if it was a great Hanukkah. Um, Kwanzaa, if that's the case. And also, hope you all will have a wonderful New Year's Eve and two nights um, I will be in Canada celebrating uh, New Year's Eve. And then, of course, um, Saturday and Sunday, I'll be driving down towards Florida. And I'll be in Florida. Oh, by the way, so I will be in the Orlando area uh, the, the week of the 4th and the week of the 11th. And then I will be down along the Atlantic coast towards uh, um, Jupiter, Lauderdale area, the third week of the week of the 18th. Uh, the week of the 20 fifth back in Jupiter and one of the location on the 28th. I don't recall right now. And I've got two days of my own coaching up in Atlanta in the middle there. And then I've got a week at a mastermind event with some KW guys. And then I've got a week in Tampa the week of February 8th. So if you're in the Orlando area or out on the coast of Florida where I've already taught and you want to do a workshop, as long as I know guys a week in advance, I will come to your workshop. And for free, I'll get up and speak for a few moments and help you guys out. So keep that in mind if you want to pull that off. That's one of the best techniques you can you can use to get clients. Um, let me know. I'll be more than happy to help you out. Okay? All right, guys. I hope you have a wonderful night. And uh, you guys take care. And, oh, Angie says, me and Anastasia. Oh, you're working with Anastasia. Angie, that is awesome. Um, all right. Tell you what. Give me a call, Angie. If you could, don't wait till the night. Give me a call this Saturday. Or Sunday, I'll be driving down. I got plenty of time, and let's walk through the, uh, the launch sequence, okay? Okay, you guys have a great night, and we will talk to you soon.